Christ is risen, everyone. I guess we get to say it. Truly is risen. One more time, maybe at the end of the night again, before we move on to uh, the Ascension, which we are going to be celebrating tomorrow. So, but this evening, I'm not going to speak to you about the Ascension. Um, what we have on the schedule is what we'll be commemorating on Sunday. Uh, Sunday will be the seventh Sunday after Pascha, and the commemoration of the, uh, the 318 fathers of the First Ecumenical Council. So before we sort of get right into it, um, I want to read to you the Troparian for the feast, uh, as well as uh, one or two other hymns that um, that sort of set the tone and also ask the blessing of, uh, of our Holy Fathers uh, on us this evening. Um, so the first one is the Troparian for this Sunday, and it says, Thou art most glorious, O Christ our God, thou hast established the Holy Fathers as lights on the earth. Through them thou hast guided us to the true faith, O greatly compassionate one, glory to thee. The Kentuckian, the apostles' preaching and the Fathers' doctrines have established one faith for the church, adorned with the robe of truth, woven from heavenly theology. It defines and glorifies the great mystery of orthodoxy. And... Uh, this mention of adorned in the robe of truth uh, is particularly fitting for this commemoration of this feast because there is a miracle, uh, an appearance of Christ um, to, uh, I believe it was Peter, one of the uh, bishops, uh, about how uh, he saw Christ with uh, wearing a robe that was torn in half. And when asked, who did this to you, Lord? He said, uh, Arius did this. And this is what this council was called for, to deal with such teachings. A final one uh, from Vespers of the Feast. Let us praise today the mystical trumpets of the Spirit, the God-bearing fathers who sang a harmonious melody of theology in the midst of the church. One Trinity, unchanging essence and Godhead, the overthrowers of Arius, the champions of the Orthodox, who ever intercede with the Lord, that he have mercy on our souls. So I think it's particularly fitting that uh, that we ask this great cloud of witnesses, uh, these trumpets of Orthodox theology, uh, that not only would they be with us tonight, but be with us um, all, all of these tumultuous days that we live in, where um, so often we we hear people disparaging. Um, the dogmas, the teachings, and the tradition of our church that was laid down um, by these holy fathers working with the Holy Spirit in order to uh, to guide us and to protect us in times like we're experiencing uh, today. Now, we commemorate the First Ecumenical Council this Sunday, and <clears throat> it's particularly significant, this council, because with this council, uh, called in uh, 325 in Nicaea, we uh, are beginning what one might call the age of the ecumenical councils. Now, I've spoken to you a little bit about this before when we spoke on the, uh, the triumph of orthodoxy, the second, uh, second Sunday in Great Lent, second Sunday, first Sunday in Great Lent, rather. Um, and, um, and, and basically, you know, we have this, we can say, the age of the ecumenical councils, where we officially recognize seven ecumenical councils, the first in 325, um, the final one um, happening in uh, uh, the mid-700s and sort of receiving its final acceptance in the early 800s. Um, and then on top of that, uh, we have unofficially an eighth ecumenical council, which took place in the ninth century under St. Photius the Great, and uh, a ninth ecumenical council, 
uh, at the time of St. Gregory Palamas in the 14th century. Um, but especially these sort of first seven, the, this period of these first seven, are particularly significant. I mean, um, I don't think that one can claim in a really kind of strict way that there's an age of ecumenical councils as long as we have the church and as long as the church uh, struggles uh, to, to, to hold firm and pure the faith that was once delivered to the saints um, will continue to have ecumenical councils. But um, these ecumenical councils from a historical perspective became the occasion for the most perfect articulation of our theological dogmas uh, and of that faith that was once delivered uh, to the saints. And this phrase actually comes from the epistle of St. Jude uh, in the New Testament. It's particularly uh, significant, I think, and you hear it many times in, uh, in Orthodox writers. And um, and so at this uh, this first council, which is very significant, we have uh, the names of some figures who all of us would recognize. Uh, for example, the first council was uh, called by Saint Constantine the Great, equal to the apostles, who we celebrated uh, last Wednesday, along with his mother uh, Helen. Um, he called the council as the emperor. We have at this council Saint Nicholas of Myra, who uh, you know we all know and love. He's a very beloved saint, especially in the Orthodox world, but even even in the Western world, uh, as well as Saint Spiridon of Thermithus, uh, and uh, Saint Athanasius the Great, Athanasius the Great, Patriarch of Alexandria, or uh, Patriarch of. Yeah, Alexandria, and uh, who was a disciple of Saint Anthony the Great, who, um, according to tradition, became uh, the, the real champion of this first uh, ecumenical council, uh, and became a shining star, despite the fact that he was just at the time a young deacon. And these are just a, a few of the ones that we would all recognize right off. There's some other very significant saintly figures when you read their lives, very tremendous. Um, the kind of holiness that was gathered together at this council. We say the 318 fathers um, in the Synaxarian, I don't remember the exact numbers, it, it describes exactly how many of those were bishops and how many of those were priests or monks uh, involved in this. And, uh, and the reason for why the, the council was called simply was, uh, was the, in order to put a stop uh, this kind of division, this kind of wildfire that had begun in the church as a result of um, a sort of, at the time, a very important priest and ascetic who was in the Church of Alexandria named Arius. Um, and he's the originator of the heresy, which we now know as Arianism, which denies the equality of the Son with the Father and ultimately denied Christ's divinity, making him higher than all creation and the means by which all creation came to be, but uh, essentially he is just the Father's first uh, creature, as it were. And we can still find this heresy in sort of various forms today. Um, you can see it among Jehovah's Witnesses, among Mormons in a, in a different kind of form. And, uh, and among many anti-Trinitarian Protestant groups. And so, uh, you know, in that sense, the judgments of this council uh, are equally as important today as, as they were then. Uh, another vitally important thing that came out of this council was we received our creed from it, or at least the first half of the creed. All of the creed up until, um, and in the Holy Spirit, and I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, and the rest of the creed was completed in the uh, in the uh, second ecumenical council, and there, this is where we sort of have our, our creed, our articulation of the faith in this kind of crystallized form, and it's especially famous for the use of the phrase uh, homoousios, 
that uh, being of one essence with the Father, the Son being of one essence with the Father, and not the phrase that uh, that uh, Arius sort of preferred, which was uh, if I pronounce it right, homoousios uh, omo, omo, or something, meaning rather than same, homo, uh, omi like similar, and so of a similar essence uh, is what he wanted to claim but not and he goes uh, quite far to make it very clear uh, that it's not the not even close to the same essence he'll even go so far as recorded um, by Saint Athanasius the Great to say that the son uh, has no understanding uh, of the nature of his father because the gap between the uncreated and the creature is so great that even Christ, in Arius' estimation, can't golf, bridge that gulf. Father Matthew, if I can... Uh, so, um, can but because I spoke, uh, back when I spoke with the Triumph of Orthodoxy, about what an ecumenical council is generally and what its characteristics are, um, first I guess I would encourage you to, uh, you know, if you have time before Sunday, you, know, you could go back and look at that, uh, the video which was the first Sunday of Great Lent, the Triumph of Orthodoxy, and to see the kind of uh, characteristics of an ecumenical council and some of the other comments that we made generally about that. But tonight instead, I want to focus more on uh, the importance of those who go into making an ecumenical council. And what I mean by that is these holy and God-bearing fathers of our Holy Orthodox Church who, have, uh, who work in cooperation with the Holy Spirit in these councils so that the decisions uh, that are put forward or are orthodox and are um, truthful witnesses to the, uh, the, the truth of our faith. Now, um, with this in mind, uh, we'll just have a peek at, at some of these uh, not so much the, the particulars of these figures, but, but in general, why are the Holy Fathers so important? Um, and why is it so important that we follow them even until today? And to help me with this, I, uh, I'm going to refer to you uh, some quotations from uh, a wonderful book on this topic, um, on the importance of the Holy Fathers. It's by Father Theodore Zisis. Um, it doesn't exist in English, though Father John uh, has been undertaking a significant translating project in order to make quite a few of these articles available. Um, but this sort of simple introduction on the importance of the fathers, Father John has actually translated, and so um, I'll be referencing his quotations so we can all thank him next time we, uh, we have him here so that we have access to this text in English. Um, but I'll just begin. And yeah, the name of this work is called Following the Holy Fathers. Yeah, that's the English translation. Um, on what, however, is this claim, asks Father Theodorus, that the Church Fathers are so significant and important for us today? Uh, firstly, he says, they are equal to the Holy Scriptures in weight and authority. This is very significant. This is one of the defining uh, differences between us and many of the, uh, the Western traditions, or the modern Western traditions. Though we honor in the Orthodox Church the Holy Scriptures, as is fitting, we do not consider them to be the exclusive source of the Church's teaching and practice. The Holy Scriptures are undoubtedly God-inspired texts, but they were written within the context of the Church's life and experience. This, will be tr this is of tremendous importance. Um, so I'll just make a, just note that this idea of the uh, within the experience of the church's life uh, and experience, it is the church which passed final judgment on the books of the Bible, determining which among them were to make up the canon, i.e., the body of both the Old and New Testaments. Now this is a very you know important point that you can focus on when you're talking with your Protestant friends who uh, are giving you a hard time about holy tradition um, because the canon of scripture is uh, quite a late, uh, it was formed very late 
at the time of these ecumenical councils, uh, within the uh, the early ecumenical councils. And so it's not as though we received, you know, tables of the law like Moses did with God writing with his finger on these tables. You know, they were passed down through the church, uh, and not only were the sort of authentic texts passed down, but there was lots of other texts floating around because these weren't just like in book form. These were floating around as letters that had been sent to local churches uh, or that local churches had sort of portions of. And so um, in this what we, we see is this idea of tradition um, really in its sort of most uh, crystallized form because we only had even the writings by traditions of local churches what, uh, what they claimed to be of apostolic authority and what they would continue to read and practice um, within their within the church uh, assemblies, as it were, and during the church services, and so the collecting of these together is something that happens at a much later date. And you know, you can ask your Protestant friends if they begin to sort of you know uh, debate you on on this particular topic. Uh, well, how did how did they decide which books to choose? Why did some books go in and not other books? And, and what that automatically does is it refers things back to some other kind of standard that stands outside of uh, the Holy Scriptures by themselves. Um, it's not that the Holy Scriptures won't testify to this standard because of the internal consistency of them, um, you know, but it becomes uh, a much sort of harder case to make Whereas when we see how the what the church was referring to, they were referring to what have we always already believed and what has been handed down to us. And that's how we can kind of sort these things out. And when we hold up these various writings, um, when we look at them themselves, uh, when we look at their origins, and we, when we look at their, um, uh, their sort of own consistency in terms of do they teach the faith or not, um, we what we can recognize is that there, there, these even this even the formation of the canon is being um, referred to the experience of the church and the experience of the body of Christ as a standard to decide and to make clear what scriptural writings were consistent with the experience of the church uh, and which ones weren't. And, and so I mean that's sort of part of the whole process. So I think this is. Um, you know, another Im important difference in why Holy Tradition and why the Holy Fathers are so essential for us. So, um, we'll continue. Um, the Church created the Holy Scriptures, not the Scriptures creating the Church, Father Theodore says. The teaching of Christ and the Apostles is found in the New Testament in written form, and it is for this reason that they are unique. Their entire teaching, however, is not contained, that is, of Christ and of the Holy Apostles, is not contained in the texts of the New Testament. Uh, these contain only a portion, since the work of Christ and the Apostles has never ceased, nor has it even been interrupted. What falls outside of this written portion, then, is preserved by the Church in her tradition. And we can see this early on. Um, you know, because we've, there's very little testimony, for example, in the in the New Testament about explicitly what the church services looked like. There's very little reference in the New Testament, uh, you know, other than what we see in Acts with the first council in Jerusalem about some of things what we would later come to be called sort of canons governing the sort of order of the church. Um, and yet we find that even very early in the history of the church. Uh, we we have these sort of documents in these texts, for example, the apostolic canons. This wasn't an ecumenical council, but it was a very local, a very early local council that established a kind of normative pat pattern for the church. And what were they basing it on? But the continuation of the life and the works of the holy apostles, what the holy apostles taught when they went to local churches, you know, um, and I think this is another sort of essential point. We don't have recorded what most of the apostles did when they went to local churches. You know, when we read the Acts of the Apostles, we, we hear only a little bit about a few of the apostles. 
you know, but the particulars of the sort of church practice that was being established when they were taking the gospel all throughout the world when they were traveling, you know, uh, like St. Thomas to India or, or uh, St. Matthew to, uh, to Africa or, you know, all these different places that the, that the apostles went. Um, you know, we don't, we don't see in the scriptures explicitly how they did this, and this is where the sort of tradition of the church comes in to sort of fill these things and that had recorded these things, either in the lives of these saints, but also in the sort of local councils and local canons of the church that were preserved. Um, and so I think uh, here is where we can kind of find one of the main points uh, why the Holy Fathers are so significant uh, in terms of handing down this tradition to us. Now, I'll make the point here as well that tradition and scriptures, as Father Theodore points out, are based on an experience. Um, they're not just handed down to you in this sort of uh, perfected form. But, and what I mean by that is, uh, it was the experience, for example, of the Holy Apostles writing about Christ that we receive in the, in the four Gospels. And you can see, for example, there's a different flavor to each of the Gospels. Why is that? Well, because this was uh, being expressed by a particular person who had his own, um, um, you know, aspects of his character that can also come through in the writing of the Gospel, despite the fact that we believe that these are divinely inspired and so that the Holy Spirit was guiding these uh, holy apostles and evangelists to, to write what it was that God wanted written uh, in, in the recording of their experience of Christ, um, we can see that you know, we're not getting four exact copies of the same thing. Yes, four consistent copies. Yes, four Gospels that uh, illuminate different aspects uh, of our Lord's ministry. But they're not sort of verbatim transcripts in the sense of, uh, that's probably a bad, bad analogy, but what I mean is they're not, uh, you know, the body of the apostle or the evangelist wasn't sort of suddenly taken over by, you know, God standing in them and just writing out uh, from God's personhood. Rather, God inspires them through the Holy Spirit to record um, what it is that would be best for our salvation, and uh, and and even the the holy scriptures themselves testify to the duality of the the tradition. We hear Saint Paul exhorting the faithful um, to uh, to listen to uh, that which has been passed on to them, and he says specifically in many places, whether um, by word or our epistle. Uh, we have the epistles written down. Um, well, what does he mean then when he says by word? You know, what does St. Jude mean when he says, you know, the, the faith once delivered to the saints? You know, there's this sort of automatic, the, the scriptures themselves are pointing to the fact that they aren't the, uh, the only thing. That there's other things here we need to be paying attention to, and this is what we call the tradition of the church. Uh, and, and specifically, this experience is of a person, is of you know the personal God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Uh, I had a sort of an interesting conversation. Maybe some of you guys have had similar ones when you hear what I'm going to sort of say. But um, about this expression, the one true faith, and I was talking to this person about, uh, or they were talking to me about the sort of uniqueness of all of humanity and how interesting this is that people have such different characters, uh, uh, that men and women have such different sort of characters uh, and let alone sort of different cultures and all that. And she said to me, and this is why I can't accept this notion of uh, that there could be one true faith for everyone because everyone's so unique. And, uh, and I thought this sort of expressed very well um, the, both the modern notion of religion, as it were, and, uh, and sort of a, a common misunderstanding. And, and what I mean by that is, um, what I sort of expressed to her was that I, I agreed with her if what we were taught, if, if what we meant by religion or the faith, um, you may say we do mean it generally by religion, but um, 
if what we meant by you know the one true faith was something that began with human beings and was a process of us with all of our various kind of uh, differences and cultural differences and tendencies and all of these kinds of things to sort of uh, work our way as it were up in our understanding about who God is and sort of forming all of that um, through our own efforts as it were then I, I think this would be sort of a, a, a difficulty for it and I think a person could say well how could there be one true faith because people uh, all articulate it so differently even as we said the holy apostles you know and the evangelists could articulate things differently but what I sort of pointed out was that from the perspective of orthodoxy I don't think this is a difficulty because from orthodoxy we don't believe that the holy apostles reasoned their way up to God and figured things out up to God but rather God revealed himself to humanity that God uh, came among us to reveal what he was like the son comes to reveal himself the, the son comes to reveal the father uh, as well as the Holy Spirit and so um, in that sense it's possible to have one true faith which is based on an experience of the person themselves which in this case is the person of God revealing themselves to us and so that we can trust that that's a, an accurate picture as opposed to if we're stumbling around with our human fallibility in the darkness trying to sort of climb our way up to to God and so again I think this is another sort of very significant difference that we sort of have to bear in mind and why you know we can't consider orthodoxy just some philosophy you know why Christ isn't just some good teacher because if he was still just some good teacher and this was just some philosophy basically we're stuck with all of the limitations of our human understanding of our human knowledge but when we proclaim that actually God himself came to make himself manifest to us um, then that's a whole different ballgame here now the difficulty is just whether or not we're willing to accept who he reveals himself to be as opposed to us somehow having to sort of build up a, a picture of who he is and so I think this uh, the top-down versus the uh, versus the sort of climbing up is also a very sort of significant point and and this is what again is significant for us about the Holy Fathers so roundabout way of sort of explaining one this idea of experience and why experience is so important to base what, what we're basing it on you know our faith is based on an experience of God himself manifesting himself to us this is what our faith is based on and it's not based on some just sort of rational process of sitting down and deciding what a God might be like and what we would like him to be like and then forming some kind of a picture from there so that's sort of the first part of it but the second part of it is so this is why the Holy Fathers are so significant because they're people who knew God especially in the case of uh, directly knew Jesus Christ while on earth his apostles his disciples that knew him that spoke with him that were there with him um, but as well as the Holy Fathers who had uh, such an experience of God themselves even after the fact through the presence of the Holy Spirit and through the purity of their lives um, and, and that we need to look to these people uh, as sources of, uh, of guidance for us and as, uh, as sources for guidance of the church because they become the subsequent voices of the Apostles who continue to pass on this tradition and who continue to uh, augment it we might say uh, augmented in the sense of giving it new uh, expression or, uh, or or relevant expression or something like that within their own age um, but all based on a common experience uh, of God and who God has revealed himself to be to them and ultimately to us is, is sort of the goal um, and so I want to dispel from your mind this idea, and maybe you have it, maybe you don't, but we certainly hear it a lot. This idea that um, holy tradition and the inheritance of holy tradition, which has become a really sort of dirty word in our in our days, uh, you know, everyone wants to be progressive. No one wants to, to be sort of 
looking backwards, we're all looking forward, you know, and bound by these, what we take to be mindless traditions, or this is the sort of way our culture presents it. But that holy tradition and this inheritance and these ecumenical councils are not a bunch of stuffy old men who lock themselves up together in some kind of ancient boardroom uh, in order to write down dogmas about who they decide God is going to be and who they decide God is going to be or how the church organization is going to be run uh, all this kind of stuff it's um, it's you know harkens to this old problem of people constantly look at the Orthodox Church and say I don't understand how it can work you know when you don't have a Pope I don't understand how this works when you don't have this sort of top-down pyramid structure where you have a, basically a CEO who can make sure everyone's doing exactly, you know, um, you, you know, who can organize the ship really sort of tightly or something like that, uh, which has never been the model of the Orthodox Church. We're a conciliar church. We're a synodic church. We come together in council. And uh, even in these councils, we're not even talking about voting... Um, you know, by majority or something like that, but voting by consensus. This is one of the contemporary uh, issues that we're starting to be raised in talking about uh, sort of having a, a contemporary council was that some people, some of the patriarchates or bishops started to suggest, well, maybe we should do it by majority. And others uh, vehemently opposed it and said, no, the church doesn't work on as a sort of a, the democratic model in that sense, but it works by the democratic model of consensus, uh, and a consensus that's also in line with that faith which has already been passed on, because they're not just accountable to themselves and to today. They uh, have to take into consideration the vote, as it were, of all of the people that came before them, all of these holy fathers. And so they have to have a voice that is consistent with the voice of those who have come before them. And this is because we believe that the experience of the personal God that, that these Holy Fathers witnessed to, and in these ecumenical councils, because God doesn't change, that this experience of him and this articulation about him also can't change and won't change, because God is who he is. And so um, in, in respecting that, this is why we, we always continue to look back in order to look forward. The only way that you can walk a straight line is if you have a point you know, behind you and a point in front of you that you can kind of align yourself to make sure you're, you're continuing to go in the right direction and not sort of waving off and going you know, here or there. And it's the same uh, with the church. And so uh, what these saints are doing is not this boardroom, as I was saying, but rather they're a group uh, of uh, of individual people giving expression to a common experience of God revealing himself to a human person, specifically to a human heart. And so when they're coming together, um, in the same way, for example, and maybe I've used this example to you before, I'm not sure I, I use it sort of regularly, but, um, you know, if we've all had a common experience, for example, of you know Nico sitting there in the in the front row, um, we've all met him sort of individually and in a, in a setting like this as a group. We can sit down together, and uh, if individually we had to give descriptions of him, our description might be very limited and very much based on you know sort of our perception of what stood out to us. But as we begin to speak about this as a group. Uh, we begin to bring out deeper shades of meaning. We begin to find sort of a common terminology, as it were, that best describes all of the aspects of Nico. You know, and, and this is sort of basically what we have going on with the Holy Fathers, except also under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, for the benefit of the faithful that would come after. And, and so, you know, we really do need to begin to shift the way we think about this. Did the Holy Fathers use their, their reason or their intellects? Of course they did. In the same way that, you know, they used language to express an experience that maybe they've never tried to articulate before. In the same way that I've never tried to articulate, you know, what Nico looks like or what he's like or something like that. You know, and if I had to do it for the first time, I might stumble stumble around a little bit. But but the ultimate goal being that it being based on a, an experience of a person that uh, that this is possible, and that really this is what's going on with the Holy Fathers and in these ecumenical councils, and which is why it's so significant um, 
you know, why they're so significant to the church, and why the, and why them using the natural gifts that God has given them allows them to um, uh, to work as a body, as it were. And so in Saint Athanasius, we have this you know this great mind who is able to articulate theologically um, through the gift of his intellect, combined with and based on the foundation of an experience. Uh, very, very concisely. Whereas the testimony, for example, of Saint Spiridon to the to the unbelievers there was to work a miracle, which also taught in a very sort of simple way how something could be three and one. And uh, this is sort of he has the brick. Maybe some of you know of the miracle, and they the people couldn't understand how it could be three and one, and they see the brick and, and it becomes uh, clay, and then they see it suddenly turn into fire. And then they see it suddenly turn into water, and how could it, all those three be present in the one? And it's a very sort of simple, you might even say human way of, of expressing this. And yet, it made the point in that particular situation, especially because it was uh, as a miracle. It witnessed to the Holy Spirit also testifying to the truth of what was being said. And so again, another this is another uh, aspect. We're not trying to, to say it's not good to use our minds. We're not trying to say that we have to have this sort of um, blind uh, sort of bowing to, to holy tradition. Like I'm not, We're not trying to say that we shouldn't be using our mind to express it, to understand it, to go deeper, all of those kinds of things. But what we're trying to, to sort of acknowledge is that we can't wrap our mind fully around this mystery and that when we come up with walls, we should err on the side of saying, my mind is weak and I can't understand, rather than saying, oh, well, the Holy Trinity just doesn't make sense and I don't care how many other fathers uh, say that it does, or something like that. Uh, so to continue, Father Theodore says that by means of the uninterrupted apostolic succession, realized through the mystery of the priesthood, the saints and the church fathers were empowered by the Holy Spirit to continue the work of the apostles and to preserve and safeguard the tradition of the church. And it is for this reason that the Orthodox accept the Holy Scriptures and the tradition of the Fathers together, thus denying the one-sidedness of Protestantism which recognizes the Holy Scriptures alone, this idea of sola scriptura. And he quotes, The preaching of the apostles and the teachings of the Fathers, as the church sings, the robe of orthodox theology is spun from these two strands. These two strands of the teachings of the fathers, the preaching of the apostles, which uh, comes to sort of form what we mean by holy tradition, containing all of the, the aspects, holy scripture, uh, the writings of the fathers, the ecumenical councils, the, the liturgical worship services, the hymnology, um, the hagiography, all of these things are taken together in order to paint the icons, are to, to paint the fullest picture of the truth of our Orthodox faith, and which is why it's important, even in the case of an icon, you can't just paint whatever you want. You can't just paint it however you want. That even with, we've had councils that lay down rules for what things can be painted, what things can't be painted, how they can be painted, uh, different things like this, because the, the even the image is understood to be theology in color, and therefore it has to be an accurate description, vision, a, a, an accurate depiction of this experience of the living God. And so, it's it's by our relying on this sort of these common expressions that the Holy Fathers have given us, especially in all of these forms that I just mentioned, of this common experience of the Triadic God, that today we're able to guide our own thinking about who God is, uh, especially in a world that wants to tell us, no, God isn't like the way people have traditionally envisioned him or the way Christianity has traditionally envisioned him. You know, we're in a very pluralistic society. I mean, we've returned in many ways... Uh, you know, to pagan Rome in the in the sense of uh, the sort of multitude of gods, as it were, multitude of different religious or uh, belief systems, philosophic, religious, and, and sort of quasi 
uh, systems of belief that exist and so we're, we're sort of back in this place as it were and so even more so today we need to look to the Holy Fathers we need to look to the tradition of the church in order to form our the way we think about God and not have it formed uh, either by just our own thinking or uh, more likely and what happens all the time without us realizing it is we're having our, our cultures forming it uh, what we hear from people, what we're hearing on the radio, what we hear, you know, if we watch television or movies, they're feeding us a particular vision of who God is and who God isn't. And, you know, and this is in the case, in some cases, ex in explicit depictions of it, and, and in other cases, you know, movies, what I mean with particularly religious themes sort of pushing particular agendas, but just in general, based on the way that the, that these characters are reacting to sort of situations in their everyday life and the kind of worldview that is that, that comes through whether we realize it or not. Um, and, and so the goal is for us to have this sort of common experience of the living God. The goal is for us um, through having the Holy Fathers guide us in terms of how we think about who God is, uh, as well as the sort of more foundational, more important side, for us at least, as beginners maybe, um, how we ought to live in order to prepare ourselves to experience the living God and this same experience that the Holy Fathers have had. The Holy Fathers give us both sides of it. Um, you know, they give us the, the theory of it, but they give us the practice, and they put those two things together for us. This is why it's so significant to read the lives of the saints. Well, you know, oftentimes we read the scriptures and say, well, what would Jesus do today? Well, read the life of a saint, of a contemporary holy person in, the, in our church, and you'll see what they would do today. Or you would see uh, what they would do in different situations, and, and you sort of see the continuation of the work of Christ and the holy apostles also in the in these lives because we get to see how did they put it into practice you know what does it really mean when the gospel says you know love your neighbor well when we turn to the lives of the saints we can see wow uh, they really meant love your neighbor they go to some great extremes in order to sort of do that things that we wouldn't necessarily uh, think to do or be willing to do and so but this is the goal, is for us to, to, to have the same kind of experience of God in its fullness. But, you, but just as the Holy Fathers uh, and the Holy Apostles didn't just uh, have these experiences without the proper sort of presuppositions, the proper preparation of themselves, so too uh, we have to, to do that same preparation. We have to walk the same path that our Lord walked if we want to be made ready and in a position to be able to receive, as it were, this experience of God where the truth of our faith will be confirmed for us personally, not just um, because uh, we've heard it from the Holy Fathers. Um, as I was thinking about this and these sort of experiences of God and the way in which uh, over time and with preparation we can sort of more fully experience grace or at least come to recognize you know what it is we're experiencing. Um, I, I thought of the what the Samaritan said to the Samaritan woman. We just celebrated this two weeks ago, right in the Holy Gospel, and they said uh, at the the very last verse, John four forty two. They said to the Samaritan woman. Then they said to the woman, "Now we believe not because of what you said, for we ourselves have heard him, and we know that this is indeed the Christ." the Savior of the world. This is the goal of, of us as Orthodox Christians, to not just believe because, uh, because we have heard from the Holy Fathers, because we have heard from the Holy Tradition, but because we put the things into practice, and we've begun to transform our own lives, and that we can say with confidence that we have heard ourselves uh, this Christ, and we know that he is the Savior of the world because he's saving the world within us. Uh, he's transforming us. And, you know, I, when I say experience of God, I'm not necessarily meaning, you know, visions of Christ or visions of angels or all these kinds of things. These are things to actually flee from. Um, you know, the tradition is very clear. You know, there's some monastics who prayed their entire monastic life, Lord, never let me see a vision because they're so afraid of falling into delusion, of falling into pride, of falling into vainglory. These are all sort of temptations. But 
there are ways in which we experience God every day, every moment. We experience His grace and His workings uh, in our lives, and not always in pleasant ways. Sometimes it's in suffering. Many times it's in suffering, for example, where we begin to sort of just taste His comfort or we are able to bear something that we would never normally be able to bear. It's in those moments that we begin to sort of recognize the taste of grace. It's in, it's in the, these moments of peace that we sometimes maybe get to feel where, you know, we understand maybe just for even a moment what it means, you know, when the priest says, when he says, peace be, peace be unto you. Um, the, the, there's this sort of touch of otherworldliness, and it's not necessarily sort of overwhelming, and it's not trumpets. I mean, my, my theology professor, dogmatic theology professor, I've mentioned him before in Thessaloniki, he would talk about this, and he would say it's the difference between um, a created peace and an uncreated peace. And they're so different in what they are that, you, you know, people tend to fall into thinking they're just differences of degree. Well, I felt peaceful when I was, you know, laying out on the beach on vacation. Uh, and I guess the peace of Christ is maybe just more peaceful than that. And he would, he would he was very sort of um, insistent, no, the difference is a, a difference of quality, not of quantity that we're talking about something completely otherworldly. And so this touch of grace can be very subtle, can be very, um, uh, you know, hard to explain. Um, but these are all of the kinds of experiences of God that when one becomes experienced in this, they can begin to sort of recognize. And so we get this especially from our ascetic and monastic tradition, only not because uh, being a monastic automatically makes you able to sort of receive grace and being a lay person doesn't, uh, or a person who lives in the world. Not at all. Rather, their focus is just a bit more intentional and a bit more intense many times. The environment is more conducive to it, so they become a little bit more practiced in it. But that doesn't mean that we can't find the same practice if we make the conditions of our life conducive. You know, if we find a place of stillness, if we find times to pray regularly, if we can find, you know, get up early before everyone else is up while it's still dark, you know, to say the Jesus prayer for 10 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever, you know, we can do, or we'll do it in the evening, if we can do that sort of regularly, if we can kind of have a schedule, all of these kinds of things will contribute to us being able to understand um, this experience that the Holy Fathers talk about and begin to recognize who God is and how he works in our lives and who he's not. So that when someone says, you know, uh, grace is, you know, like this very sort of overwhelming charismatic experience that knocks you on the ground, uh, you know, and you are you overcome with this kind of laughter or, or, you know, you lose, you know, all rationality and start barking like a dog. You know, there's people that believe that these things are manifestations of grace. Uh, but if we're living the spiritual life, if we're sort of swimming within the tradition of the Holy Fathers, we will be able to recognize ourselves the difference between uh, things that are true manifestations of the grace of Christ and things that aren't. Um, and so this is sort of uh, where we're aimed at. But we need the Holy Fathers in order to sort of set the foundation for us and that we can continue to compare ourselves to. And we need a spiritual father to be sort of revealing uh, all of our sort of spiritual life to that they can help kind of guide us along um, this path. Um, I have sort of some more to to go through, but maybe just let me sort of see what we're, I'm not going to go through all of this for us, but um, what I yeah, I'll, I'll just say the final thing that I was going to. Uh, well, let me say this point first. Uh, I won't read what Father Theater has to say, although it's excellent. You can find the article on uh, online. Type in Father John Palmer and Father Theodore uh, Theodorus Zisis, Z-I-S-I-S, and you'll find the uh, this article. Um, but uh, the one point that Father Theodore makes is that we need the Holy Fathers because they're in these interpreters of the tradition, interpreters of Scripture for us. And he said, uh, he points out that um, we have this sort of, as he says, the chorus of heretics that have misunderstood and misinterpreted uh, the Scriptures um, who had so much confidence in their intellectual abilities. And this is what we, this is a particular temptation for our day. We, you know, were sort of, quote-unquote, very well-educated people compared to other generations. You know, 
most of us can read at a, a quite a decent level. You know, we've had many years of schooling. Um, uh, you know, we have an incredible access to information that people in past generations, even just people within last decades, haven't had in terms of having the internet. I mean, when you think about how recent a phenomena this access to information is, you you know, we have so much at the tip of our fingers. Um, but the temptation of this is we become very very much over intellectualized. Uh, and we sort of judge everything, you know, based on our, you know, on our minds or something like that, uh, to the exclusion of the other half of what we've talked about, which are the sort of the living of of the faith and the uh, the knowledge that comes from putting something into practice and le learning it by experience, as it were. And so, what we have in the Holy Fathers, though, is that. Uh, we have people who they understand the faith because not just because they were smart, but because they actually lived the faith, and because they put it into practice, and because um, uh, they were illumined as a result by the Holy Spirit, so that even their intellectual faculties, as I said, were illumined, and the Holy Spirit guided them to help keep them from error because they had such humility, because they had a desire just to serve the church and not for their own sort of you know, selfish ends or to justify their own sort of moral behavior. Elder Sophroni makes a point about this. He says, the reason why you know prayer is higher than uh, sort of intellectual theology, as it were, reading sort of theological books or being a professor or something, is he says, uh, a person can commit some very grave sins and still be able to go and give a theology lecture, still be able to write books and articles on theology, still be able to read and understand to a certain extent what's going on. But he says a person who commits grave sins can't go and pray, that it will interrupt your prayer and it will stop it, and, and you won't be able to sort of get past that until you make things right spiritually, as it were, you know, through holy confession, things like that. And, and that was his way of kind of uh, articulating um, you know, why we need to spend more, less time just focusing on our mind and thinking we're somehow getting closer to God that way and, and start putting things that we're reading into practice. You know, he used to suggest something like only reading 15 minutes a day, but doing what he read, as opposed to reading great wealths of, of uh, books and never doing anything that's written in it. And so I think that's a, you know, particularly important thing that the fathers have to teach us today um, and, and that the economical councils themselves have to teach us and how we think about them. And, uh, and I guess that's sort of really the final point. I mean, Father Theodore just says this wonderful thing about um, the Holy Fathers not only taught the faith but also applied Christian teaching and practice. He says, words are easy. It is putting them into practice which is difficult. So it's just a continuation of what I'm saying. One proves the truth of what he teaches only by living it. Many great philosophers, scientists, teachers have failed to leave their mark on humanity because of the obvious variance between their words and their actions. Um, many of these prove unable even to change themselves. How then will they transform others? And again, we go back to this medical model of the church that, you know, um, the reason why we know the church is is true or that it, that it, uh, that what it's telling us to do is trustworthy is because it works. When we see the saints, when we see the process that they go through to be transformed, then we understand, okay, we know the tree by its fruit. And therefore, if they follow this path and if they're guiding me down the same road, I'll follow these, uh, I'll do the, the, you know, the, the common sea of our Lord so that I can be transformed so that I can understand and so on this uh, Sunday as we're celebrating uh, the Fathers of the First Ecumenical Council uh, let's pray that they would guide our our understanding of the faith but that they would become witnesses to us of what it means to put our faith in practice what it means to confess not just with words but chiefly with deeds um, and, you know, to stand up in the face of a world that wants to say these dogmas that the Holy Fathers have given to us as revealed truth are, 
uh, are not something just to be tossed away or to be treated as though I have faith, you have these dogmas, you know, as though, um, you know, God isn't a person, he's just some sort of blob out there that we can mold however we want based on the, the way we feel or what we've had to eat today. Um, and so let us look to them and their proclamation against uh, particularly the sort of heresy that we saw uh, of those who want to, to deny that our Lord, uh, God the Word, God the Logos, truly became man for our salvation, that, uh, he, that in Christ what we have is perfect God and perfect man who is able to understand, who is able to transform us, and who is able to bring us to his Father. And so, through the prayers of the 318 God-bearing fathers, O Christ, God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Um, if you have any questions. Yeah, I mean, uh, Father Matthew, thank you. Can you hear me all right? Yes, I can. Um, just a quick uh, note, when you were mentioning from the very beginning, uh, you know, the Jehovah's Witnesses and and the omoousion and omiousion of the mm. same essence and similar essence. Yes. I'm not sure what your experience is out in, in New Brunswick and, and in other parts of Canada or even in Greece, but I've noticed here um, in, in, in our vicinity the uh, increased uh, tenacity of uh, Jehovah's Witnesses, their presence in a lot of places, you know, for literally days on end, like uh, my mm. work, for example, I start really early in the morning, and they're there, and I leave late, and they're there, and they're interchanging people. Right. And, you know, coupled with the fact of, you know, certain ecumenical escapades that we've been noticing in, in the media and whatnot, mm. and I, I'm wondering if you can comment on, you know, uh, you know what what is the meaning of all this, meaning are these further signs of the end times, and if they are, um, you know, what, what can we as Orthodox Christians do when we have this... I'll call it negative experience hmm. of uh, either viewing these people or just even walking by them. Um, so to comment to the first part, I haven't noticed anything in particular in our area in terms of uh, increase of these kinds of things. Um, and while I know in Greece, you know, there are this kind of stuff, I think I experienced more of it in Korea than I did uh, than I did in in Greece or around here any time recently. Um, if anything, I've noticed more Mormons about, but I don't know that that's that they're actually necessarily increasing. I'm just maybe more aware of it. Um, so maybe that's dependent on region, you know. Uh, we have places where the church is particularly strong. We have places where it's less zealous, and you know, we could assume the same amongst amongst them as well. So with Mormons, Father Matthew, if I can interject, so the mm -hmm. kissing cousins of the Jehovah's Witnesses, right? So because both yes. of them. I deny the divinity of Christ, which is the greatest blasphemy of blasphemies, right? So I, I just yes. I found that interesting to note that if you're saying that you're seeing the Mormons increasing, we're seeing over here, and at the same time, couple the fact with you know, um, you know, the ecumenists uh, really turning up the the notch, uh, you know, w with their um, escapades. I call it earlier, but I'm not sure what else to call it. Um, that you know, it, what does all that mean for us as Orthodox Christians, and you know? What would uh, you suggest our uh, hmm. demeanor would be in response, if necessary? Yeah, well, just like a, just to sort of clarify, I don't know that I've noticed a, an increase per se. You know, I I just am sort of more aware of them. I don't think it's any more necessarily than uh, than ten years or fifteen years ago, but from my own experience here. But uh, you know, I think that's sort of in many ways sort of beside the point. Um, the main way, I guess, you know, to deal with these people, first of all, is to try to deal with them with love, try to be as patient as possible. Um, I don't recommend getting into, you know, debates or conversations with them because, uh, you know, they're very difficult to speak with. They speak from their a very particular perspective and, uh, you know, they're very practiced at what they do. You know, they ask particular questions to lead you to answers that you don't necessarily want to go to or mean to go to. And so first thing I have found with dealing with these groups of people is, uh, you know, as much as possible, if you know, if you're in a situation where you can't avoid sort of a conversation, um, 
I try to change the playing field as much as possible. I try to immediately go into, rather than answering their questions, I start telling them what orthodoxy believes. And so what I found is particularly helpful about that is that the mindset of orthodoxy, all of these things that we've been talking about, about the scriptures and holy tradition and all these different points and that, you know, uh, really that all these things are based on an experience of the living God and with living vessels of the Holy Spirit who exist today who can guide us and things like that, it really changes uh, their script, as it were, because they're usually going to come at you in a presupposing more of a sort of a Protestant model, they'll sort of speak the Bible to you, as it were. And so that, that was one way. But again, it's probably best not to to sort of engage in those conversations as much as possible. Maybe give them a, just a very brief synopsis of orthodoxy and say thank you, but no thanks kind of thing. Again, they can be very persistent. You have to show patience. You have to show love. Um, you have to remember, you know, these people are, you know, anyone in delusion, you know, anyone in false belief is in a kind of mental sickness, as it were. I'm not saying they're clinically mentally ill or something, but my point is to view them not with contempt, but to view them with pity, you know, and not, again, with sympathy, I mean, with empathy, with love, seeing these people as, you know, creatures of the, you know, creations of our God who are, are so far from being able to receive uh, his truth because of the sort of the, what they've received. So I think that's sort of difficult in terms of the ecumenical dimension of things. Well, you know, just that's sort of a general, uh, a general struggle, and you find it uh, in greater or less degrees depending on where you are. You know, some sort of ecumenical things, you know, can be sort of reasonable, as it were, in terms of okay, you're just being civil with people of other faiths or something and not being hateful. That's that's entirely the the right kind of thing to do with ecumenism, but the sort of uh, in more organized or official ways, um, you know, those are probably you know those are things you're going to want to avoid uh, because they're going to put you into compromising situations that are going to be very awkward to get out of, and uh, and it's not that every time you're necessarily going to be put explicitly in a compromising situation, but over time they're, they're definitely going to happen, and uh, it's best just to sort of avoid them. See what I was trying to what I was trying to get at with that part there is that on the one side it's understandable for let's say Mormons Jehovah's Witnesses in particular you know because as you mentioned very correctly that you know to to feel compassion for them because they're obviously misled but when you see the other level where you have quote unquote Orthodox and other quote unquote Christians who officially don't deny the the, the divinity of Christ mm -hmm. you know in a public in a very public way very official way. Um, doing things that uh, I would say are inexplicable because they mm. do know the truth. There's a difference between somebody who either was born in that you know wrong tradition or has been misled by people. Yes. That's one thing. But the others who are in the bosom of the church mm. you know, and and leading others astray. Uh, you know, it's interesting because we just had you know the Sunday of the blind man and we see all these things happening and then. Yeah. Yeah, you know, yeah. I think again, this just sort of continues to confirm for us why we need to run to the Holy Fathers, why we need to become steeped in them as much as possible, why we need to be reading over as much as we can the hymnology of the Church, you know, uh, why we need to be living the basics of the spiritual life, reading spiritual books, trying to speak with spiritual people, you know, why our vacation time should try to be spent, you know, visiting holy places as opposed to sitting out on the lawn or something or going to the beach or going to, you know, on these kinds of vacations. You know, we need to begin to take these things more seriously, you know, and, you know, we can't, it's not like earlier generations where we could just sort of lay back uh, on our faith and just say, well, everything's going to be fine if I, you know, basically if I go to church and listen to my priest, everything's going to be okay because my shepherd is going to shepherd me appropriately and therefore I don't have to, you know, do that much. We're not in that situation anymore. We're not in that situation in Orthodox countries, and we're certainly not in that situation, uh, you know, in non-Orthodox situations like we're in. Uh, perfect example, uh, what's going on now with the religious education in Greece. If the, if the only religious education that they're going to get right now in Greece, these children, 
uh, or you know, from teachers who maybe got a degree in theology but who are explicitly telling the kids, uh, this is what they tell me to teach you, but I don't believe any of it. You know, if this is where our religious education is going to be, even in Orthodox countries, well, guess what? It's time that the church and it's time that the, the parents, uh, you know, are, are doing something else. And it doesn't necessarily mean take it out of the schools, but they certainly need to be, um, you know, pushing to sort of uh, to augment it or to correct it or all of these kinds of things. I mean, we need to do more now. Uh, that's just the way it is. And certain times call for us to do more, just like in the case of the Holy Fathers. Sometimes they call for more. And maybe we don't like it. You know, maybe we don't like having to, uh, you know, travel hundreds of, you know, kilometers in order to go to, to be in a spiritual environment you know, with our kids for one week of the year or something. But that's what we have to do if we want to, uh, to be serious, to, to sort of preserve our faith. And, um, but again, with this sort of ecumenical stuff, uh, you know, you, I hear it all the time. You hear it. Oh, well, you you know, you can't disagree because this or that bishop or this or that patriarch is doing this. And uh, the fact of the matter is, all you have to do is say, show me where the Holy Fathers have done that. If you show me where in the Holy Fathers they're doing similar things, then I don't have anything I can say. You know, uh, and that's really what it comes down to. And at the end of the day, as long as you can continue to say that, um, I mean, what can they say? At the end of the day, they're either going to have to say, I don't care what the Holy Fathers say, um, or we're past the Holy Fathers, as we're starting to see some movements that are just beginning to even arise in Greece. Um, you know, or they're going to go to the Holy Fathers to try to disprove you, and uh, as happens with a soul that truly is open, um, Sometimes they go to disprove you, and they end up disproving themselves. And you can ask Father John about that if you uh, if you want to know of an example uh, about how that works. So, um, I, I guess what I would say to us is just we need to immerse ourselves more in the Holy Fathers and the sources of Orthodoxy, and our consciences will be will be clear, and we can guide to people to whatever as much as they're willing to be guided and not be we can't be overcome by uh, false shepherds because you know uh, I'm not saying all of these people are false shepherds my point is when there are you know sometimes wolves in sheep's clothing we can't be overwhelmed by that and we have to uh, you know we have to understand this is the history of the church you know Arius was a priest uh, you know I, I went through one of these times I think and and sort of pointed out how many of the the chief sort of heretics of our church were patriarchs of Constantinople, Nestorius, uh, you know, just go through them and you'll see the majority of the heresies we have were from clergymen. So, um, you know, this is not something that we should be sort of particularly surprised about. And again, we don't make judgments on, you know, the state of a person. The church has to, to make these judgments. We can't act rashly, you know, and start uh, causing schisms or spreading slander or those kinds of things because a lot of people thought St. Nectarius wasn't very good either. Uh, but guess what? It turns out he was, you know, the saint of, our, of the 20th century in Greece. So, um, you know, we do have to be sort of careful about how we do that, but we have to hold people up to the standard of their church and, first of all, hold ourselves up to it. Thank you, Papa. We have a question from uh, Zizi. Okay, Father, uh, thank you for coming down. Uh, okay, yeah. what I was going to say is with respect to what you were saying and Nico was saying about everything with the ecumenism and all these things going on. Um, okay, do, first of all, there's a reason I'm bringing this up. Uh, do we need a, with an, out, people outside of the church, I'm not interested in them because they're not orthodox and I try not to speak to them about matters of the faith. I just try to be nice and polite to them and when it comes to religious matters, I just say, listen, just go to this priest or go there. I don't want to get into discussions with them. Uh, mm -hmm try to be nice to them and that's it but with people within our own flock right whether it be lay people or priests or whatever do we when it comes to like certain issues that the church has like specifically said this is 
uh, an innovation. This is heretical. This is this. This is that. No, the Holy Fathers don't have an expiry date. Um, do we need a blessing to discuss this, these matters and expose them to other people? Do we need to be saints? Do we need? Uh, is it considered judging, or has the accuses of what's the word? Iero categoria, in other words, hierarchical condemnation, and at the same time, um, we, you know, obviously we have passion, so it's very easy. We're talking about these things, we fall into vainglory, uh, ego, pride, whatever, and then obviously those passions lead to other passions, etc. Et so, um, what are your, um, what's your thoughts on that? Sure. Uh, always best to have a blessing from your spiritual father, uh, because not necessarily like each time you speak, but in general, ask your spiritual father. Anyone, all of us should ask our spiritual father, because many times we're mistaken, uh, mistaken either about our capabilities, or uh, you know, for speaking or for not speaking. You know, there have been times when. Uh, you know, I thought I should speak, and I've been told, don't say a word. And there's been times where I thought I shouldn't say anything, and I was told, no, you should say something here. And so, uh, you know, in, in humility, if we bring these things to our spiritual father, God can illumine them to tell us what is best for us in particular, and how sort of as a general principle we ought to go about these things. Um, I would say uh, I wouldn't get sort of caught up on, uh, you know, we can speak the truth of our faith, and if the person is willing to listen, either orthodox or non-orthodox, um, then we can speak as much as they want to hear. But when you can clearly say they're not interested in hearing, then just get out of the conversation. It's not easy to do. Uh, you can ask anyone in my family. <laughs> it's not easy for me to do it. Uh, you know. But at the end of the day, I mean, that's sort of the goal. Because what's the point? You're here to sort of benefit the people by talking. And if it's not going to help them, then what's the point? Uh, you know, Elder Joseph was sort of very clear on that. Um, he, he would sort of point out, the Lord says, uh, you know, ask and you will receive. Uh, and he, uh, if, if someone asks you to go one mile with them, go two. And he, but he makes the point, but if they don't ask, then, then you don't give. And I think that in these particular cases, that's sort of the best, the sort of best time in which that uh, example works so that we just don't get into the, the situations. Now what that requires is a bit more prayer from us and being a bit more cautious with our words and um, and more perceptive to uh, the people that we're speaking to. So if we happen to make this mistake of getting in too deep, just don't make it the next time, you know, and just say, okay, that was that didn't work out well. Do my best to avoid it. Um, you know, when you get people who are sort of vehemently opposed to... Uh, you know, uh, you saying anything against, uh, uh, you know, a clergyman, you, you know, you can say with all humility. Uh, if Again, I wouldn't necessarily get in directly with them or with other people, but I don't think it's wrong to point out to people we are not, uh, we don't believe in a, you know, papal-centered model where just because I put on a rasso I can suddenly tell everyone what to do and they have to listen to me whatever I say. The history of the church doesn't uphold that. Uh, you know, the Council of Florence doesn't uphold that. You know, we've had false unions, we've had robber councils. You know, we had a St. Maximus the Confessor, where he was the you know the last, you know, as it quote unquote as it were, uh, confessor of orthodoxy in a sea of uh, official hierarchy and even faithful that had uh, had turned away from the true faith. Um, it does bring in the question about being a saint, which again, certainly it's easier for them to do. And, but again, with the blessing of your spiritual father, you know, whatever, whatever God wills. St. Peter says we need to be ready at all times to give an account for our, uh, for our hope, as it were. And, uh, and so I don't think that's, uh, you know, we can expect help from God in these moments when, when it's blessed and when God sort of requires it from us. Thank you, Papa. We have uh, two more questions uh, from the women now, so we'll balance that off. <laughs> Great. Uh, first by uh, Vicky. Yeah. Okay. So, Father, um, yes. there. I mean, one of the things that Nico was talking about were escapades, and I don't read the news, so I just looked this up. Mm. I guess my concern is after uh, I re I recognize that people think extremely positively of uh, Pope 
the new pope and wow. think that there there could be potential progress there. The concern I have is when you have the patriarch and the pope and the Armenian church praying together in the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, mm. th that we're always being told that, you know, because we don't have the same faith, that we can't pray together. So as a Sunday school teacher, when I'm telling someone who's Catholic that, you know, there are significant issues between our churches, mm. and that's why we don't recognize Catholic baptism. Then you have the patriarch praying with the Pope um, and the other Armenian church that hasn't happened in probably a thousand years. Well, mm. well, how do we how do we deal with that? Because it's um, I guess it's it's difficult because they're they're sending the different message. Yes, uh, again. Uh, this is why this is where it becomes really important to know our faith as much as possible. Um, attach ourselves to to priests or spiritual fathers, maybe who are who, who know these things or who we can kind of learn from, who give talks on on this on the faith from a orthodox perspective. Because the fact of the matter is, uh, the canons over the over the course of seven ecumenical councils very clearly and explicitly forbid. Uh, joint prayer with uh, with heretics, um, with the penalty that a person who does this ought to be, if they're clergymen, they're defrocked, and if they're a layperson, they're excommunicated. So, I mean, uh, and this isn't one or two isolated canons. I think there's something like 25 canons in reference to this, and again, not from one council, from many councils. Um, that being said, uh, we have to do things with uh, with uh, discernment. We have to. We can't be rash about the way we do things because it has taken the church. In the case of Arianism, for example, it persisted in the church for over a hundred years. So, uh, and at times, you know, ninety percent of the church or so you can find in the the history books, ninety percent of the church were Arian, um, or had a, you know, or were being led by Arian. Sort of clergy and different things like that. So, I think in that sense, we we don't need to be uh, we need to think on the church's time and not always think on our time, in the sense that we expect things to happen really quickly. But the church has a different sort of standard. Again, iconoclasm. It took 100 years for us to, 150 years really, to sort of completely stamp that out, and the, the sort of confirmation of orthodoxy. That said, again, what do you do when you're dealing with Catholics and things like that. I have the same sort of issue. A lot of my family members are Catholics, and um, you know, uh, it depends who the person is, whether or not you're going to get into it with them, or whether you're just sort of going to say, "Oh, yeah, okay." But uh, you know, if if you do have to to sort of get into it with people and feel like you need to sort of take a stand for that, you can just sort of gently point out without it being too accusatory. That um, you know, again, we don't believe in this sort of uh, clergy-centered model where whatever the po the patriarch or uh, or clergyman does is law for us. That we believe in a in a church that uh, that works by taking into consideration the voices of you know uh, of everyone, especially those that have gone before us. You know, and if you begin to sort of present these things and sort of gently mention that. You know, some people, you know, don't always, uh, for whatever reason, you know, aren't uh, maybe following as closely some of the traditions of the church. You know, and, and, and make them understand a little bit. I guess that's a, it's a difficult question. Depends. It's differently for every person. Depends on the conversation unfolds. All these kinds of things. But as a general way of going about it, if you can sort of gently explain how orthodoxy works, in the sense that we're based on. Christ is our head, the Holy Spirit inspiring living members uh, based on the foundation of holy tradition and scriptures, and that no clergyman is free to depart from that tradition. Um, like Then you don't have to say anything about what clergy are doing. You just can say that, and you can let them figure out what the repercussions of that are. Um, and I, I think that's as far as maybe we, we need to go in, in many cases, and just sort of say, yeah, well, 
the church is the body of Christ, but it's made up of human individuals, and sometimes, you know, for the sake of love, we we go to uh, to excess. Sometimes, you know, there's lots of ways to to sort of explain someone's behavior. But in the case of what's going on right now, uh, I would just stand behind the statements of Metropolitan Hilarion of the the Moscow Patriarchate, who I think very rightly and very appropriately said. Um, we believe that he, he wrote in probably two paragraphs, I probably can't even explain it as concisely as he said it, that we respect uh, the ecumenical patriarch as first among equals um, in, in, in council, but um, because the ecumenical patriarch did not consult with, uh, didn't, there wasn't a gathering where he consulted with the other uh, patriarchates and the other hierarchs, that um, you know, any actions that he takes are not mandated actions where he's speaking as the voice first among equals uh, of all of the hierarchs because they didn't sanction him to do that and and so that when whatever actions he may or may undertake or whatever statements he may make represent only those of the Church of Constantinople uh, and him as a as an individual hierarch as opposed to speaking as a sort of a universal voice of the church um, because he can't speak in that capacity in this particular instance because he wasn't given uh, the blessing by the other patriarchates to, to do that. And that's how it works within orthodoxy. You know, we have to be careful not to fall into a, a papal-centered model and that the ecumenical patriarch is just some kind of Eastern pope. Um, that's just not the way it is. And so as long as we delicately and gently sort of explain these things to people, I don't, you know, it doesn't necessarily make them any happier about it. But you can just say, I just follow the Holy Fathers, and uh, with the blessing of my spiritual father, this is what I do, or something like that. I don't, you know, I don't know if that, uh, there's, no, there's no one answer. Let's just put it that way. We'll give the, the final question to Fanny, so we have a, you know, balanced approach to men, to women. Mm -hmm. Very good. Okay, um, you mentioned that one of the apostles preached in India and another one preached in Africa. Um, I was just wondering, how come the Orthodox Church is not predominant in these countries, like in the United States? Yeah, well, uh, there's, t I guess, two reasons. Half is um, Half of the reason is heresy. A lot of the churches that were in those places um, departed in, into heresy, became uh, monophysites. Uh, this is this would be the Coptic Church, the Egyptian Church. There's a lot of sort of divisions even within that. Um, throughout India, there are Orthodox. That's not well known, but they're uh, again they're a, a monophysite group, the so-called Indian Orthodox Church. Um, so that that's sort of the the first you know part, and well, in the same way that we would say. You know, half of the West, uh, you know, half of the world, the Orthodox world, departed into heresy, in the case of uh, Western Christianity after the schism. Uh, so that's not unusual in that sense, unfortunately. And then the other side of things that we sort of would take into consideration in a place like Africa or the Middle East are uh, the rise of Islam, which is sort of was very militant, certainly in its day, um, as well as today. We sort of see many of these groups uh, you know this is what's happening right now <laughs> so um, a lot of the Christians either get killed or they get driven out they become refugees somewhere else so I, I think that's probably one of the main one of the main parts but at the same time you know as the people were even pointing out 30 40 years ago you know the gospel now is really at the point where, in many ways, it has, for the first time in history, been preached to all the ends of the earth, and that we have the sort of capability to do this, and that we uh, that we've sort of seen this happen. And while we don't, um, maybe a lot of the historic churches maybe have fallen away. If you look in the Revelation, how many of those churches, of those seven churches, still exist? You know, and our Lord, right from the right from the first, sort of warns about this. But um, but it, what we also don't always notice is how many people are converting to orthodoxy in these countries. And there's large numbers of people that are that are becoming orthodox, that are finding the true faith. And uh, and so I think from that perspective, it's very hopeful as well. 
Uh, thank you so very much uh, for giving us the talk tonight and answering our questions. Uh, God willing, next week we'll have a, a p panel discussion with the three of us, with all of us. Yeah. And uh, if you could just uh, end with a brief prayer of, of your choice, since uh, tomorrow we have the apodosis, well, today's the apodosis, but tomorrow with the ascension, whatever prayer you would like to end with would be great. Sure. Thank you. Sure. Well, let's uh, end with one of the ones that we began with, asking our... Uh, the Holy Fathers to uh, to guide us in these days of confusion, and uh, and to help us to uh, to become confessors and trumpets of theology. The prayers of our Holy Fathers, the Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us. Let us praise today the mystical trumpets of the Spirit, the God-bearing Fathers who sang a harmonious melody of theology in the midst of the Church. One Trinity, unchanging essence in Godhead, the overthrowers of Arius, the champions of the Orthodox, whoever intercede with the Lord, that he have mercy on our souls. I mean. I mean, Papa, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Calavradi. Peace, thank yeah, you. Have a nice evening. Peace.